Lord forgive me for this trap shit Sergeant Smack make it backflip Telly hanged it with the action With the vato speaking Spanish Frank Matthews how I vanish Poof. Came back like I'm King Tut Go BBS is on a beamer When Fat Cat was tearing queens up Fall off the profit not the re Fly like Puerto Rican Jesus Uptown like I'm Baby Man Just caught a touchdown After 16 years without a win in Portland, the Pistons finally find the secret to success in trailblazer territory in Game 3 of the NBA Finals. We all look at the city of Detroit as one of the most dangerous in the nation. As according to U.S. News, it would end 2022 with 309 homicides. But back in 1990, while the Pistons were on their way to winning back-to-back NBA championships, the city would go on to record a whopping 582 homicides. And there would be six of those homicides that would occur on St. Albans Street that would show exactly how hard crack had hit the city. So what else is new? Or that since January, 37 children have been shot dead and reaction was, oh, it all depends where you live. Well, in Detroit, they don't imagine those horrors. They live them. Now, I've heard of a guy dealing crack in Detroit could make $1,000 a day. Yeah, it's possible, yeah. May, maybe more than that. More than that. A day. It's a lot of clothes. A lot of clothes. Man. A lot of girls hanging around. Women. Hello. This is a prepaid debit call from... Honey. A prisoner at the Michigan Department of Corrections. This call is from a correction facility and is subject to monitoring and recording. Thank you for using GTL. Uh, my name is Tamar Marie Marshall, and I am prison for first degree murder, the, cap the crime that was committed in 1990 on St. Alvin Street. Nearly 30 years have passed me by. I broke the law, I won't tell a lie, but I never killed one single soul. They painted me to be so darn cold. My life is wasted because I tried to survive. So mad I didn't help save their lives. I'm begging, hoping, praying for a second chance. I invent life-saving products to enhance. No one pays attention to the foul play, how the prosecutor and forensic guy lied their way, changed the ballistics of all the guns, just to place one in my hand so they won. Appeal, what a mockery and a joke, no matter what evidence I have to invoke. It's ignored, they won't follow their own law. This is a complete judicial flaw. Now my commutation is on the governor's desk. I pray for some good and hope for the best. Have mercy on me, you'll never regret. Be strong, I know some will be upset. I implore, don't judge who you've never met. My number is 212-812, please don't forget. I'm remorseful and my eyes are very wet. Yeah, yeah. Sure got pop a lot. We back on mob business. We on our way to Michigan with it. The D. All my guys from the east side, west side, y'all flood the comment box. Y'all know a lot of this mob shit started here. Now, today, I'm going to do my best to tell you guys about a time and a crime in Detroit that will forever change the city. And just based on the statistics was arguably the most dangerous time in Detroit history. And just like a lot of other urban cities in the late 80s and the early 1990s, crack would come into town and change lives forever. And on April 4th, 1990, Tamara Marie Marshall would essentially become the face of the crack game as she was charged with one of the most heinous acts that the city has ever seen to this day. And what is now known as the St. Albans Massacre 
six men between the ages of 15 and 32 would end up losing their lives, with one being the alleged ex-boyfriend of Tamara Marshall, 32-year-old Stephen Owens, the alleged target of the attack, who numerous people would paint as a mid-level drug dealer who was said to be in charge of running the alleged crack house that he and the five other men would be murdered in, with the other victims being 22-year-old Rodney Lewis, 21-year-old Carl Williams, 18-year-old LaVon Robinson, 16-year-old Bobby Lee Frazier, along with 15-year-old Robert Lee Hill. For six young people to lose their lives, it's not much published about that horrific night on St. Alvin Street. But when you review the minimal amount of information that is out there, two stories emerge. Until this day, it's still some mystery of which one is the truth. According to authorities, Tamara Marshall, who was also known as Honey, would be picked up at her mother's residence in the Southfield section of Detroit at 6 p.m. that day. She would be picked up by a guy by the name of Mark Kaysen, the only person that would cooperate with the authorities. He would go on to admit to the police that after picking up Tamara Marshall from Ninth Mile and Lachere, they would drive to the home of Mark Bell on American Entirement, where they would meet him and another gentleman by the name of Jamal Biggs. According to Kaysen, it wouldn't be long before the conversation would turn to money, then saying that Tamara Marshall would tell the group that she wanted to go to her ex-boyfriend Steve's house to hit a lick. Kaysen, who was also the getaway driver, would say that Tamara would draw up a scheme of how she would get into the residence and then come back for the other guys. Now, when you hear six people killed at a crack house, you would think that's everybody eliminated. But in what would be a laundry list of mistakes that Michelle Marshall and that group made, and probably the biggest one, would be a female by the name of Janet, who was allegedly the new girlfriend of the deceased Stephen Adams. She would go on to testify that in the night of question, she would be upstairs in a bedroom watching videotapes where she would overhear a conversation between Tamara Marshall and Stephen Owen, going on to testify that Tamara Marshall would then leave the apartment and return about 10 minutes later with another gentleman. She said she would hear Tamara Marshall calling out for Stephen Owens. After hearing those three calls, she said the next thing that she would hear, saying, you must think you're really bad. You don't think I'll shoot you. Saying Tamara went on to search her purse, then lead her downstairs, where she would see Owens, Frazier, and Williams, along with 15-year-old Robert Hill, who she would tell authorities that she did not recognize at the time, all three men being lined up against the dining room wall. And it would be right at that time when the situation would get kind of out of control because while having the four people at gunpoint, it was said that customers would continuously be knocking on the door. In Jamal Biggs' confession to the police, he would admit that they would be moved from the dining room to separate bedrooms upstairs. The three men would be loaded into a separate bedroom while Janet would be put in a bedroom by herself where she would be later joined by a close friend of Stephen Owens. Rodney Lewis, as well as another gentleman by the name of Ivan, who is loosely described as a drug addict. Now, Janet, in a play that probably saved her life, when she was asked by Mark Bell what was her age, she would go on to lie, saying that she was 14. Though it might have saved her life, she would say that it enraged Bell, who proceeded to kick Stephen Owens in the head while repeatedly questioning how a 32-year-old man could be involved with such a young girl. And it wouldn't be long after that where, according to Janet, the shooting just began as they would proceed to go room to room, essentially eliminating the five men. And it would be during that carnage where LeVon Robinson would find himself victim as he and a friend would be cutting through a series of vacant lots to get to Stephen Owens' back door. LeVon Robinson's surviving friend would tell the police that as they arrived at the back door, they would encounter a female crack user. And as they banged on the back door with no answer, they would proceed to go to the front. After entering the front door and seeing the house was ransacked, he said Jamil Biggs would approach the group of three from the street, letting them know that the house had been ripped off. And that's when the group would be caught off guard by Bell walking downstairs, where they would be told to freeze and put their hands up. 
at that time, he said LeVon Robinson would be taken to the basement and essentially executed. And only after hearing some footsteps going outside of the door, he would proceed to take his chance and take off running, where he would essentially escape along with Ivan and the unknown female crack user. The case would go on to be featured on national news as the media would use it to highlight the evils of the crack era. After the numerous mistakes that I've mentioned and y'all probably noticed, Tamara Marie Marshall would end up being sentenced to life in prison, where her version of the truth was a lot different from Mark Cassin's, as she would admit though she was doing something illegal by going over there to purchase drugs, she had nothing to do with any kind of murders. The media would go on to describe her as a reckless female robber whose family had been involved in a fatal shootout at a motorcycle club. But what's not spoken of enough is one of her accomplices, Mark Bell, was also at the same time wanted for the murder and robbery of a man where he would only get $2.70. Though the robbery on St. Alban Street netted a little bit more, about $2,000 in cash and three and a half ounces of cocaine. No matter what story you choose to believe, I'm sure all parties involved will say that it wasn't worth it today. Y'all make sure y'all hit the red subscribe button right under this video so y'all know when this real trill spill shit is dropping. Y'all get in the comment box below and flood it. Let me know what cities we need to go to, what stories we missed, what gangsters we haven't covered. And y'all get at me on Instagram, Twitter, P-O-P underscore A underscore L-O-T. Y'all already know how we run it. Mob gang.